Faith was examined. Found we have written down a field theory which we call d equal four because it is in four dimensions. N for one because there is one symmetry, uh, fermionic symmetry called supersymmetry, and we call it supergravity because it contains the Einstein-Hilbert term of ordinary gravity. So this is the Lagrangian. In fact, we integrate it on a four-dimensional manifold, which is a deformation of flat Minkowski space, if you wish. So it's a curved manifold. And the Lagrangian inside this integration, we have found <coughs> to be the Einstein Hilbert term. Which reproduces <coughs> the factor minus four, the usual Gauss curvature integrated in the invariant volume element, and then here we found we found the minus four gamma five gamma a covariant derivative, Lorentz covariant derivative in the sense that it contains the Lorentz uh, connection, p connection, psi d a. <coughs> this whole thing. Uh, it is written in the language of forms, so it is it is invariant by construction under change of coordinates, uh, which is one advantage of using forms for gravity theories. So it has general coordinate invariance, or if you wish, isomorphism invariance. <coughs> Uh, okay, which you can also express, if you wish, in uh, infinitesimal form on the other lead derivative we have seen, and you can do the exercise, for example, if you uh, change coordinates by x mu that goes into x mu plus epsilon mu, and this is an infinitesimal parameter, which may depend on x, the infinitesimal coordinate change, then you will find, for example, that the field bind, the field bind field of the manifold varies in this way, under this variation of infinitesimal diffeomorphism. And this is just an output of applying the lead derivative along this tangent vector with these components, d nu, d nu, d nu. Here we have the so called transport term, the transport term that is, uh, that contains e nu not differentiated, and then you have a second term that contains uh, the derivative of the parameter. This is the usual <coughs> infinitesimal diffeomorphism rule for the field line from any dimension. And this is part of the diffeomorphisms rules on the basic fields. The basic fields of the theory are D, the spin connection, and the gravity. <coughs> this can be repeated for the three fields. You have diffeomorphism on the three fields. The effect of changing by an infinitesimal parameter the coordinates on which these fields depend. These rules are similar. And this is well known when uh, you consider diffeomorphic invariant theories. These are diffeomorphisms. They are not gauge symmetries, they are diffeomorphic. It is a different kind of symmetry. It is local, <coughs> but it is not like a Young Mills gauge symmetry. And we'll uh, elaborate a little more on the difference between these two kinds of local symmetries in a moment. We have another symmetry in the game that is local Lorentz invariance. Local Lorentz invariance, which is a gauge symmetry. This one is a gauge symmetry of this Lagrangian. Actually, it is a symmetry of the Lagrangian, not of but this is really a symmetry of the action. But this is a symmetry of the, of, the, of, of the Lagrangian, which means that these indices, these Lorentz indices, 
can be locally rotated, rotated with local with rotations, Lorentz matrices that depend on space-time, and the whole thing is invariant. In fact, it is invariant because you are using, you see, you are using curvature in the connection, and you know that this transforms homogeneously under Lorentz rotations, and you are using Lorentz invariant tensors like the epsilon tensor and the Eta, the metric, the contract indices, all of these are Lorentz invariant tensors. And so you see what you have contracted indices and contracted indices with Lorentz invariant tensors. So the whole thing will be invariant under local Lorentz rotations, <coughs> finite rotations. Infinitesimally, uh, they will be invariant under. Rotations, infinitesimal rotations with infinitesimal parameter that will have two indices, anti-symmetrized indices that are the same two indices you find in the Lorentz spin connection. <coughs> so, for example, under these rotations with Lorentz rotation parameters, Lorentz, this varies in the usual way, which is this, right? And this is a local parameter. We have the parameters connected to the rotations in six planes. You can, <coughs> six words. <coughs> so you have this local Lorentz invariance, which is a gauge invariance. Under these local Lorentz invariants, the omega transforms as a, as a gauge connection, as a term which is the derivative of the parameter that has another part, homogeneous part. And so you recognize this as a true gauge symmetry of this action, of this Lagrangian effect. It is the, the Lagrangian itself that is invariant under this gauge symmetry. Finally, we have found another symmetry, which is supersymmetry, which we wrote down, <coughs> and uh, we wrote it down, and uh, the variations under supersymmetry that now have an epsilon parameter, which is, if you remember, a spinor field, it is local, it depends on spacetime, and we found the following rule. We found that under the following rules, the action was invariant. Here we have Ed a parameter. And finally, and finally, we can compute who is the variation on the omega spin connection induced by the variations of these fields, because if you remember the omega spin connection, we worked in second order formulas, the omega spin connection was found to be expressible in terms of the epsilon. So now we can also find who is the supersymmetry transformation induced by the supersymmetry on the physical fields according to this dependence. And you find it by the chain rule. It would be a little bit tedious. There is a quicker way to do it. The quicker way to do it is to observe that the field equation was this. The torsion equal zero was the field equation that allowed us to express omega in terms of EMC. And what you do is to vary this, this torsion and to impose that the torsion constraint equal to zero stays zero under supersymmetry. So you require this, which is necessary because you want the torsion constraint to hold even under supersymmetric transformation, because the whole thing, the whole scheme has to be locally supersymmetric. So it is better to conserve this constraint that gives me this dependence. And here, this, if you do it, will produce for you this variation here. Why? Because this, if you remember the expression of the torsion, <coughs> which was a 
the A minus I have some bar and gamma psi, then you have to vary <coughs> things inside this, this thing. So you have here variation of the A minus here you have variation of the beyond that you are looking. This is the thing you are looking for, dB. These indices are always contracted with the Minkowski metric, even if they are not one down and one up, because I don't want to think about position every time. Minus omega dB, epsilon dB, dB. And I did <coughs> this first part here, right? Because this was dV minus omega dB, dB. And then I'm varying this, and then this, and then this. And now I have to vary the last part, minus i half. And you have a factor of two, because in fact, this will give you two times. You will have two terms to vary here. But since these are my Riemann spinners, you will have only one. You can write it in this way with only one. And that's it. So you see now, you just plug in the variation of v and the variation of uh, Psi that you already know from here, and what you find, <laughs> what you find is that the variation of omega is equal to well multiplied by dv, multiplied by dv. I bring it on the other side equal to and here we have here a and substituting the variations of the supersymmetry of the field. This is the variation of the V field. You see this, you can, this and this, you can recognize as a covariant derivative on this variation. Covariant derivative of this variation, because here there is the omega. So I write it like this, and the variation of the field VB was simply this expression here, so write it like this. And then you are left with minus I, Psi gamma a, and here you have the variation of the psi field, but the variation of the psi field is just covariant derivative of the epsilon. But this, you see, you, uh, you can flip this, and you recognize that this is only i epsilon gamma a epsilon. <coughs> because in fact this you can write by flipping it and uh, this is just because this is Mariorana, this is Mariorana you can interchange them you put a minus sign and what you get then are two terms. Uh, well, what you get is that this cancels the term that comes from the, the derivative here. And it leaves you the term only with the derivative here. So, so this is the answer for the variation of omega d multiplied by dp. But again, this is the same form that we ended up when we had to compute uh, omega from torsion equal to zero. But there is the same trick, the same, the same trick we did in local in uh, curved coordinates, and we find out by exactly the same manipulation who is this. And the final expression for this that give you the answer, since the manipulations are exactly the same. You have the two field binds. And then you have the epsilon bar, gamma mu, and here you have a row. This row, I will tell you <coughs> with this row. This row is simply this thing here, the two components of this. Let <coughs> me write some place. Shine here. You see deep side. Is a two form, and I call it for short rho. This I will interpret as the gravitational curvature, exactly as this I interpret as the Lorentz curvature, and so on. Sorry, uh, yes. So it's a, a last line. Now, 
Yes. Uh, so you could go D uh, of the actor gamma A. Uh, because there is the A in the It means just the uh, event only in the past. No, but D is only. On, on these fields here, but it does, does not act on the gamma e, the gamma a. But gamma a is a constant, so yes, it is constant. There are two terms: one is the derivative of gamma is vanished, and the other one, the connection. Yes. Okay. Okay. So there is a little bit of confusion because you say, "How come this has a Lorentz index, but it is a constant matrix?" What is the meaning of a covariant derivative of it? Okay, so let's clear this, uh, this, this stuff immediately. What I'm saying is the following. This, I'm claiming, transforms as a Lorentz vector, as a Lorentz vector with index A. So when you do the covariant derivative of such an object, which is a field that has a Lorentz vector, gamma A, then indeed, this is the D of this thing. And then you have to put this, since this is in the vector representation, you have minus omega AB, the same thing with index B, I epsilon bar gamma D psi. Claim this. Now, what I claim is that this is exactly equal, exactly equal to what you obtain by taking, by the Leibniz rule, the covariant derivative first of this and then of this, ignoring the gamma A. Okay, I'm proving now this. This is equal, this is equal to the D, this, and now instead of considering D as a package, as a field with the Lorentz index A, I'm considering it as a product of fields, and I'm using the uh, Leibniz rule for the Lorentz covariant derivative. So uh, let me use the Leibniz rule. This will be equal to plus, and then I will have I, d epsilon bar gamma a psi plus, with the plus sign since this is a zero form, so the, the derivative goes without d psi. I'm claiming this. And I'm claiming that this is equal to this. Let's see why. Now, I have to write down explicitly who are the, these derivatives. <laughs> Remember that d epsilon bar, we said, is equal to d epsilon bar plus uh, one fourth omega AD, let's call it CD, gamma CD, and this gamma CD acts from the right, since this is an epsilon bar, so this transpose. <laughs> and then remember that d psi is equal to d psi minus a fourth omega CD gamma CD psi. Now you substitute this here inside, you substitute it inside, well, you can do it as, as an exercise, you substitute it uh, here, here, and what you will see, what you will recognize, is a <coughs> commutator, you will build up a commutator between a gamma with two indices that comes from here, so you see you have a gamma CD, gamma A, and here we have a gamma A, gamma CD. Now, the commutator of gamma A with gamma CD produces you, produces you another gamma with one index. And, uh, and, and uh, <coughs> deltas. So it, it produces you a, a, a gamma with an index. In fact, it will produce you something like this. Uh, eta A gamma C, eta A C gamma D. And uh, with a plus or minus sign that I don't remember. So it produces you something with one gamma. And in fact, this something with one gamma is exactly the thing that you had obtained here, only one gamma here. And in front, this eta AC will identify these two indices of the object. So you just go through this computation and you find out. There's in, that indeed this D acting on this package that you recognize as a Lorentz vector is exactly the same D uh, you, you can 
well, the same provided the real exterior derivative you obtain by using the Leibniz rule in the field. So this is why I'm being uh, but this is always so. I mean, you have seen it for even in one half fields when you are doing the field theory. You know very well that psi bar gamma mu psi transforms as a vector in these are direct fields, it transforms as a vector under Lorentz transformation, the usual lambda mu mu Lorentz transformations. Even if this, in this case, is a numerical matrix, right? And why do you see it? Because you act on this and on this, and uh, acting on this, which is in the spinor representation of the Lorentz group, gives you a, a gamma a rho sigma matrix. Here you, you get a gamma rho sigma matrix, you put the commutator, and you see that the commutator produces your gamma. Why? Because this is, in fact, a generator of Lorentz rotation in the spinor representation. So this generator acts in this adjoint fashion on the vector representation and produces your rotation on the vectors. But this is I mean, standard stuff that you have seen when you have studied Dirac equation. In this respect, there is nothing new. But the upshot of this is that here you have finally the the three terms, right, with plus, plus, minus, it's always the same structure. Where, where this rho mu is simply, this is a two form, I call it rho for short, and rho can be expanded on a decoordinate basis, like this. And these are then the coordinates of this. <coughs> Appearing here. These are the components of the gravitino two form, which I interpret as, if you wish, a curvature, since it is a covariant derivative of something that behaves as a connection from the supersymmetry. As you see, you could have wondered whether supersymmetry now can be interpreted as a gauge variation, as a gauge transformation. These are the complete rules of supersymmetry transformation. This is an induced rule. But these are the, the rules that we tried, and we found out that we have a symmetry of the action. And now you would recognize here the typical, the typical behavior of a gauge field. Because a gauge field, when it is transformed under a gauge transformation, transforms typically the covalent derivative of the parameter. Now, this could prompt the hope that maybe supersymmetry is a gauge symmetry. But well, this hope is not fulfilled, in, in, uh, at least in this kind of uh, four dimensional theory of gravity, of supergravity, because it is not a gauge symmetry. Why it is not a gauge symmetry, uh, we will see in a very short while. And in fact, we can discuss it in detail. So these are the supersymmetry, local supersymmetry rules for this action. Now let's discuss let's discuss the symmetries we have found. We have these three kinds of symmetries. One of them is certainly not the gauge symmetry, that is diffeomorphisms local coordinate changes, x that was in x plus epsilon. Another one is a gauge symmetry, local Lorentz invariance. And supersymmetry, I'm claiming now, is not a gauge symmetry. Then you see it would be very nice if, if we had a unifying framework where 
all these three symmetries, which are variances of the action, are interpreted in the same way. They are on the same footing. It will be intellectually satisfying and also illuminating on the structure of the theory, if I manage to find such a framework. What I'm <coughs> going to do now is to illustrate such a framework, where all these symmetries will be part of the same symmetry structure, and they will be all unified into something. Now you have two options. You can either unify them in a geometric setting where all of them appear as diffeomorphisms in some bigger space, and this is one way to unify everything into diffeomorphisms, but in a bigger space where you add coordinates and you recognize as diffeomorphisms along these coordinates, these new coordinates, you recognize supersymmetries, usual diffeomorphisms, and Lorentz rotations. Or you could try to unify everything into gauge symmetry zone. To write down the theory where supersymmetry appears as a truly genuine gauge symmetry. You have these two options. And indeed, these two options have been explored both. And both give interesting <coughs> results. The option where everything is gauge, in fact, leads to a kind of theories that are called chern simons theories, and uh, we will discuss them briefly tomorrow, because they offer a unification uh, formalism where all the symmetries, bosonic and fermionic symmetries, are unified into a supergroup gauge symmetry. Here, today, what I want to do is, is, the, is the first option, unify everything into something geometrical, interpreted as diffeomorphism when it comes to the symmetries of the action. In fact, <coughs> what we would like to do now is to do something very natural, since we have field binds, spin connection, and gravitino, we know that there is a supergroup that is in one to one correspondence, whose generators are in one to one correspondence with field binds, spin connection, and gravitino. And it is a supergroup whose generators are translations, Lorentz rotations, Lorentz generators, and, and supersymmetry charges. The supersymmetry charges you have in uh, studying in the previous lectures, where this is one supersymmetry charge, and this is the spinor index of the supersymmetry charge. I will use four dimensional spinor indices, so it's not alpha and alpha dot. This alpha goes from one to four. Now, this supergroup is the super Poincaré group. Since this will be the generators of the Poincaré subgroup of this super Poincaré. And this is what I want to do. In fact, we will see that when I try to write down what are gauge transformations of the gauge theory on this super Poincaré group, I will find some transformation rules on the fields that resemble these ones, but are not the same of, of these. Are not the same of these. In fact, we will, we will now enter the group geometrical setting, but I anticipate the result. Uh, gauge transformation generated by this QA give you exactly these rules exactly these rules on V and Psi, but give you something different from omega. The gauge transformation of the omega field is zero. So you see that you cannot see this theory as a gauge theory of the superquantary group. It does not work. 
because if you constructed the gauge theories under these uh, under these algebraic structure, super then you would find the correct gauge transformations here that would reproduce the supersymmetry transformations we have found, but it does not agree on the spin connection. So supersymmetry is not the gauge transformation. Supersymmetry is not the gauge transformation. So this is a gauge transformation. The diffeomorphisms are diffeomorphisms, and they are not gauge transformations. And supersymmetry is not the gauge transformation. You can see that it is not the gauge transformation also from another fact. From the fact that if you take the commutator of two supersymmetry transformations, then you find the celebrated fact. You find a translation, a local <coughs> translation, when you act on the field line. And now I will show that two supersymmetry transformations, local supersymmetry transformations, give a local translation of the field line field. And this is why it is said that supersymmetry is the square root of gravity, right? Because when you do the anti commutator of two supersymmetry charges, then you get then you get a local translation on the field, but only on the field by field. On the gravitational field, this anti commutator of two supersymmetries will in fact not close. Let's uh, examine this factor. And this goes under the chapter of on shell supersymmetry bodies. Well, let's do it. I take the commutator. Well, in fact, I, I can first write down what is the variation first on the supersymmetry transformation with parameter epsilon 2 and then supersymmetry transformation of parameter epsilon 1 on the field line. On the field line. So this is. And here I have the supersymmetry transformation with parameter epsilon 2 on the field line, which is gamma epsilon. Then I have to vary this, and this is equal to pi epsilon 2 gamma a and therefore epsilon. Right? Uh, epsilon. <coughs> epsilon. Because the variation of the psi is the covariant derivative of the variant. And here the only thing that varies is this. Now you can you can take the commutator of this. Notice I'm taking commutators and not anti-commutators because here I'm dealing with parameters. So it's really parameter times supersymmetry charge, which is bosonic. I think. The commutator on this is equal, well, you work it out, and it is equal to i times epsilon 2 gamma e. E epsilon 1 minus epsilon 1 gamma e e epsilon 2. Again, you can recognize that this is equal to minus i, and here I can put the covariant derivative on epsilon 1 bar gamma e epsilon 2. Just by using by using the Leibniz group. After having flipped this with a plus <coughs> remember <coughs> C gamma A is a C symmetric matrix. I can flip the things, but this is a one form, this is a zero form, so it has the opposite rules that I have with one forms, and then when you flip it, it gets a plus sign. So flip it, there's a plus sign, and then this will see. Okay. So you see, on the field line, a commutator of two supersymmetry transformations is <coughs> this thing, which is in fact, which is in fact the gauge translation, <coughs> which is in fact a diffeomorphism. 
that this you can recognize because this thing, if you write it down, has exactly the same form of the diffeomorphism that I just erased. In fact, this can be a little exercise to be seen. <coughs> okay, but we'll see. On the field line, you can express diffeomorphisms also with the formula that I gave you before, but it is equivalent to this formula where you have a covariant derivative on the infinitesimal parameter. You can maybe remember it on the metric. So here it seems to work. The commutator of two supersymmetries is a gauge is a, is a different model. So far, no need of equations of motion. But when you do the same stuff on the psi field, there you get something that requires the equation of motion. Why? You do the same stuff on the on the the same exercise on the psi field using, using the uh, transformation rules of the gravitino and the supersymmetry. And what you find is something that looks like minus i. And here you have, again, a translation by a parameter epsilon 1, gamma a epsilon 2. You see, you have this composite parameter also here. And here you have dA psi c. This is psi c. And this would be OK. It would reproduce, again, a uh, diffeomorphism of the psi field with infinitesimal parameter given by this. But you get terms proportional to the gravity of its equation. OK, so this tells you two things. First, that supersymmetry, as we already know, cannot be a gauge symmetry, because otherwise it would close the representation of the action of a, of a group. And secondly, it tells you that if you want to interpret it as a closed algebra, you cannot do it, because there are terms proportional to the gravity of field equations. Then supersymmetry closes only on shell if the gravity of the equation is open. This is why we say that this action is on shell supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a, a local symmetry of the action. It is clear that uh, if you if you do the commutator of two things that are symmetry of the actions, you should find the symmetry of the action. <coughs> and in fact, you find the symmetry of the action, but it is a symmetry, I mean, this is infinitely infinite dimensional. I mean, you have infinitely many symmetries, which you cannot interpret as, as a finite set of symmetries that close in this way. It is a Algebra with closes with structured functions rather than structured conflicts, and so you have infinitely many. But this, you already know that it must be the case because diffeomorphisms have have the same properties. So yes? uh, I I don't understand what you mean that if that's not close in <coughs> supersymmetry is not a gauge symmetry because as far no, no. as I understand. Uh, you have the same problem with local Poincaré translations. Yes. Uh, so Poincaré translations should be a, a gauge symmetry. No, uh -oh. Poincaré translations are not the gauge symmetry of the of the of the Einstein Lagrangian. Diffeomorphisms are a symmetry of the Einstein action, okay. but uh, translations are not a symmetry of the. Of the, of the action, of the Einstein action. Th there is a difference between the gauge translations and the diffeomorphisms. Yeah, yeah, I know. Exactly. And, and we will see this difference now when we enter the group uh, geometrical setting, but they are not the same transformations. I mean, they do not coincide. And we, are, we know that Poincare gravity, for example, is invariant under diffeomorphisms, not under these uh, gauge translations. I will write down gauge translation and diffeomorphisms, and they are different on the field. 
being different on the field line, then it means that uh, it cannot be a symmetry. Yeah, because gauge symmetries act on the fields, and geomorphies are on the coordinates. That's, that's right, but you can uh, transfer the action of the coordinates on in an action on the on the functional dependence. I mean, you can bring everything in the same point and change the functional form of the field. Right? You can uh, transfer the action on the field, which is induced by an action of changing uh, by infinitesimal parameter the coordinate of the field. And this you do, in fact, with, uh, with the lead derivative. Because the lead derivative gives you a, an infinitesimal change of the functional form of the field, which is induced by a coordinate change in its x dependence. <laughs> So we are, in fact, indeed, in, in the same uh, situation as we are in pure gravity, where the translations were not a gauge symmetry. Now here, the super translations are not a gauge symmetry. The translations, the usual translations, are not a gauge symmetry of this theory, and the super symmetries are not a gauge symmetry of the theory. And indeed, both will be seen as part of the super-translations of the super -Mancadic. So this is the scheme. What I'm saying is simply that this has to be a symmetry of the theory, but you are not recognizing it as the symmetries you started with. Simply this. And recognizing it as one part, which is a symmetry I started with, is uh, uh, diffeomorphisms on the side, this is okay, plus you have an, an, another part that is a new symmetry, and you are generating infinitely many, many new symmetries. They are all symmetries of the theory, but because, because of this, they do not close on something that you can call diffeomorphisms, supersymmetries, local or association. It is an infinitely bigger set of symmetries. If you speak in the dynamical symmetry of the equation of motion. Yes. You could interpret that as this. Now, this may be a problem. Maybe a problem when you want to quantize the theory, because we know how to quantize theories, gauge theories, where symmetry is nicely close, and you have a finite set of generators and, and uh, the algebra and everything. But here you see you are confined to symmetries that hold only on the equations of motion, which is a problem in quantum theory because in quantum theory you have path integral. The path integral explores also off shell configurations. And so this thing, to have only on shell supersymmetric theories, will be an obstacle to the quantization of supersymmetric theories. This obstacle is surmounted in some instances where we know how to solve this problem in this, even in this scheme here, and we know how to solve it by adding some new fields. In, in fact, this will be called auxiliary fields, and by adding these new fields that will not be dynamical, the equations of motion will solve them in terms of the dynamical fields omega, psi, and d. But these auxiliary fields will have the nice property that on the set of all these fields, physical plus auxiliary fields, then these transformations will indeed close. And so these auxiliary fields serve the purpose to have an off-shell supersymmetric theory. And this is why auxiliary fields are an important tool if you wish to pursue the quantization of these theories. Which is a worthwhile attempt since the N equal 8 equal 4 theory seems to have some chance to be finite. Seems. Seems to have this chance because, in fact, it is being recognized as some kind of condensate between two theories that are finite, that are N equal 4 young mills in four dimensions. Super young mills in four dimensions. <coughs> So I'm anticipating the subject of the <coughs> elephants. But now, 
I want to do what I, uh, I was announcing, that is to give a group geometrical structure to this uh, Lagrangian and action in the sense of diffeomorphisms. Now I want uh, to construct a scheme where all the symmetries are diffeomorphisms. So all the symmetries will be in fact generated by lead derivatives, but lead derivatives in, in a bigger space. And the algebra of these diffeomorphisms will be the, the usual algebra of lead derivatives, which closes on lead derivatives. In fact, the algebra of lead derivatives is very simple. If you have two tangent vectors, V and U, and you take the commutator of two lead derivatives, according to the definition of lead derivatives that I gave you, that I gave you earlier, on any P form, you use the Cartan formula for the lead derivative. Using only this definition, when this is any P form, you will find that the commutator of two derivatives is nothing less than another lead derivative, but along a tangent vector that is now the commutator of what? these two tangent vectors. So this is <coughs> This comes out of the definition of the derivative. Now, if you do this exercise, it's, it's a good exercise to this commutator, right? Something u mu v mu, and you have to commute this with v mu v mu, right? Then you will have, since this, this depends on x, <coughs> all the derivatives of this vector components. And you will see that the lead derivative reconstructs another lead derivative with tan, the vector along which is done this lead derivative is just a commutator of this. So you see here, you have by construction a closed algebra, but it is an infinite dimensional D algebra in the sense that there are infinitely many vectors on a given manifold, and this produces. The vector that is in fact different in general from u and v and so on is the algebra of different morphisms. Okay, now let's interpret everything as different morphisms. And to do this, I have to introduce the concept of a group manifold. Well, the starting point for a group manifold is, is, is to start from a group, and in fact, from the infinitesimal version of the group, which is a Lie algebra. The starting point then is the Lie algebra. The Lie algebra we will start from, in this case, will be the super Poincare Lie algebra, but in general, you start from the Lie algebra that has generators TA and structure constants given by CABC. Okay? Now I'm using these big capital Latin letters for <coughs> the joint indices in the group. Now you know that by requiring the Jacobi identities on the commutators, this yields the Jacobi identity on the structural constants, and uh, it is given by this anti-symmetrization of this product of such constants. These are all well-known facts. For example, if you take the super pointer the Poincare D algebra or the super Poincare one, I don't care which one, then you have the translation that commute. In my normalization, the Lorentz rotations are minus one half, and here you start with eta AD and BC <coughs> plus three terms. All the terms you have anti-symmetrizing AD and CD, so this is the rule. And then the Lorentz rotations on the translations, commutator is minus one half, Eta BC PA 
minus theta ACPD. So these we have seen many times, these are the, the Poincare AD algebra relations. An example of the algebra. Then I will add also the cues to have the super Poincare algebra at the, at the right moment. Then we have, if this is 1.1, we have 1.2 that are coordinates. Coordinates, because I want to label group elements <coughs> by coordinates, and then I will have the notion of a manifold, on which these coordinates are describing, which will be called the group manifold. Now, a generic group element element, then you write as G, and this will be an exponentiation of the, of the generator with the parameter in this way, this is uh, the most general manner of what is a way to express any group element that is connected to the identity, and in fact we will stay connected to the identity in this discussion. This I can also write as Y, I identify the group element with the coordinate. I, when I write Y, I'm intending the group <coughs> element whose coordinate is are called the exponential coordinates. It's a choice of coordinates in the group manifold. Exponential coordinates. And Y is the exponential coordinate of this. And I identify with the group element itself. Okay. <coughs> Now, what I want to look at is what happens when I multiply two group elements, one with coordinate, exponential coordinate y, and another one with exponential <coughs> coordinate x. By the group law, this is a group element, and uh, by definition, this is e to the y a t a, e to the o x b t b. And this, by definition, I rewrite as a group element with some coordinates here, Tc. These coordinates I have to compute now. Uh, I call them, so far, the coordinates that describe this element here. I call them x, y, c. And now I'm computing who are these x, y, c. If I compute them, uh, no, y x. The order is y x. Y x, well, let's call it m instead of c. And uh, I, I will now <coughs> recognize that this, if this has to be a Lie group, then must be a smooth function, smooth function by definition of Lie group of x of x right I'm keeping y fixed I'm multiplying by x and uh, I do the Taylor expansion of this thing around the point x equal to zero and so it starts with y m plus it will have something something that multiplies xa, and for a small xa, I could, I could uh, stop here. If xa is not so small, I take the second order term in x, and so on. And I'm assuming that I can always perform this expansion, since this math must be smooth. It must be a smooth function of x. It is part of the definition <laughs> of, a, of a legal Notice, notice that e a m in zero in zero must be must be just delta a m. If y is equal to zero, y equal to zero. Uh, 
means really I'm considering the identity element, and y is equal to zero, y is the identity element, and then I must have x, so it means y equals to zero, and this a n must reproduce x n, and this is when this is okay. Now I'm taking x to be infinitesimal, and when x is infinitesimal, then I can stop here. And I can rewrite this for x infinitesimal. I can rewrite this as ym plus x a t a on y n where the TA is defined as epsilon A and Y D over DY N. Okay? That's immediate because we have X. TA acts on this, we take the derivative, so it reproduces exactly the same. And the X A is here. But now you see what is this? This is what we have defined as tangent vector on manifold, right? It is proportional to the coordinate partial derivatives, and here it, it has uh, components that depend on y. So this is a tangent vector field, depends on y, on your group manifold. <coughs> this operator, well, is a tangent vector. What we have uh, defined in Generality on, on differential manifold as tangent vectors. These are tangent vectors on the group manifold. Since this coordinates y cover the group, they describe, they are parameters that describe the group elements. And the space of these parameters I'm calling the group manifold. These are tangent vectors, and these tangent vectors do something interesting. They are a differential operator representation of the action of the abstract generators TA. Remember, you have these abstract generators TA to be equals C A B C T C. These are the generators of infinitesimal group transformations. Here we are looking at an infinitesimal group transformation. And so these abstract Generators are represented are represented as differential operators on the group manifold in this way. In this way, right? Because this is infinitesimal, so it's really the generators that enter into the game when you <coughs> consider infinitesimal group transformations. Now, since this is true, then you know a priori that the algebra of these vectors has to be very peculiar, these are tangent vectors, but their algebra must, since it is a representation, it must follow the same rule of this algebra of the abstract generators, so you know a priori that this has to follow this rule. Okay. Given a differential representation of the <coughs> And this leads you immediately to to a uh, a differential equation on these objects because now we plug these in here and we find that minus two. Just writing down the output of what we find. That is, a, is we call it e. Yes, we call it e. E, 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 and c. Little c, c. This is the relation you find, the relation you find when you do this here. OK? 
Okay. So just uh, a one line calculation gives you this. Good. Okay, now that we have these tangent vector fields on the manifold, we know that we can introduce one forms that are dual to these tangent vector fields, and in fact, these one forms will be the field binds. These TAs span the tangent space, so they are a contravariant basis. You see, so you can take these as a basis, and I will call this the intrinsic basis of tangent vectors, or this as a basis, and I will call it the coordinate basis of tangent vectors. Now, similarly, we can introduce one forms that are dual to these TAs, and these one forms I will call field bind on G. <coughs> the one forms duals so have to, I will denote them by the letter sigma, and they have to be dual in the sense these are linear applications, right? They belong to the dual space. Applied to the TBs must be given with delta A. They are dual in this sense. They are dual in this sense. Exactly as you have the differentials of the coordinates applied to the coordinate bases of <laughs> the N equal delta M. This is the duality in the coordinate basis of tangent vectors <coughs> one force, differential of the coordinates, and you have the same duality between intrinsic basis of tangent vectors and these duals of the tangent vectors that I will call field binds. <coughs> okay, we are almost at the end of this very short group theory <coughs> differential geometry point of view. Sigma A can be, it is a one form, depending on Y, it can be expanded on the coordinate basis. And this expansion, I will use the same, the same letter that I used for the, these components of the tangent vectors. We we'll use the same letter, but with inverted indices, A and N, N, Y, B. Y n. So notice that I'm using n n from the middle of alphabet indices to refer to curved coordinates and a b c indices to refer to these uh, tangent vectors or if you want a joint representation indices because these were really coming from these indices here. So A, B, C are tangent space indices or flat indices, flat in this sense, flat indices. And M, N, etc. are curved indices or coordinate indices. Okay. From the duality, from this duality here, you find that this matrix is the inverse of this matrix. So we find E A N and E D N equal delta A B and we find E A N E N A is equal to delta M. -M. <coughs> delta A B A B. Right. Okay. Very good. Now, the last formula I will write down before taking the break is the Kirkman Maurer equation, or better, one should say Maurer, not the Kirkman Maurer. I don't know why in many textbooks it is written as Maurer Kirkman equation.
In fact, I think that Mahler was a student of Cartan. <laughs> Maybe he found it and then Cartan. I don't know. Cartan Mahler equation. Well, the Cartan Mahler equation I, I obtained by taking the exterior derivative of these field binding fields, of these one forms, these basic one forms on the root manifold. If I take the exterior derivative, well, this is the exterior derivative of E M C D Y N. <coughs> and this is then the exterior derivative <coughs> I write in this way. It will be uh, by definition of exterior derivative, in fact, E M C times D Y N. And I, I have written the exterior derivative of this object. You see, this object is just a function of y, and the exterior derivative I write like this. It is the differential of this function. So, partial derivative times the basic differential. And then I have here exterior product d1 u. Then, by the Leibniz rule, I should take the exterior derivative of dy, but d on d gives d squared is 0, 2 times the part of the derivative is 0, because this translates into a curve, into d mu d mu minus d mu d mu, and partial derivatives commute, and so this means 0. So I don't have contribution from the d on this, and I have just this. Okay, but now I can use the fact that I know who is this. I know who is this. Because I read it from here, I read it from here, I, I, I just inverted this, putting the inverse of these matrices on this side, and this is done by taking minus one half, you see there's minus one half, and then I get C, C, D, then I get E, N, A, E, M, D, times D, Y, N, D, Y, N. And this you recognize now, this you put together with this, this you put together with this. And what you have is minus one half CAB, and you have sigma A times sigma B. And this is the celebrated Maurer Platon equation that I will rewrite here in this way. D sigma C plus one half AB C. Sigma A, sigma B equal to zero. This is the Maurer Cartan way of formulating Lie algebra. It is dual, it is a dual formulation to this formulation here with the generators, the infinitesimal generator. It's another way of describing Lie groups by referring to a geometrical structure on the root manifold whose field binds are given by these one forms. Okay? So this is the setting now we will be moving on. It will be the setting of Maurer Cartan equations. And now we recognize that in the case, for example, of the Poincare D group, then these field bind one forms. According to what is this index, the index A, in the case of Poincaré, will split into an index that is related to the translations, an index, composite index that is related to the rotations. Okay, then if you are on the super Poincaré, you would have also a spinner index, but I'm not putting it here at the moment. So A is like this, and then sigma A will split into a sigma A with a small index that I will identify with the field bind field, and an index AB that will identify with this field. So the fields, the basic fields of my Poincaré gravity, for example, will be identified with the one forms, the basic one forms on the Poincaré group menu. And if here there is also another index, a spinner index, 
because I'm looking at the super point, I look at the supercharge, then the third possibility is to have sigma alpha, and this will be identified with the psi alpha field, where this is a spin index. And this is still a one fold. As you see, it gives us a natural setting for basic one forms. All the fields, all the basic fields of the theory in this setting are one forms because they are field binds. They are field binds on a group mate. Okay. Okay, this is the setting we'll work on the next uh, the next hour. Okay, so I have a question now about the promotion of the formal and I will just explain it here as an aside. I write it like this because you see this is a, I'm a, this is the Lorentz covariant derivative. Right? It's the Lorentz covariant derivative, so it does not act on curved indices. No, it acts on curved indices. It acts on curved indices. So why am I forgetting the term here? First part I can write as D D A U D U minus D U E X U U here I'm just to write D A U Now, what's the, 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 what
Okay, okay, okay. So let me rewrite this in this way because this has only a Lorentz index, so the covariant derivative is the ordinary derivative plus the connection term that rotates this index, the only index on which this is acting because this index, these indices are compacted. So it's a quicker way of doing it. So I'm rewriting it like this. Now I'm using Leibniz rule. Leibniz rule tells me that I can rewrite this. Okay, I can rewrite this in this way. D mu, D mu A mu plus D mu A mu mu. So this is an epsilon, right? Okay. And then, then I have minus omega mu A T, D mu D epsilon. Now, uh, I recognize this with plus this this is an epsilon away I recognize as the covariant derivative on B is equal to D mu D A mu right because this is what this B is connecting to this is the covariant Times epsilon mu. Here it is. Times epsilon mu. And then I have still a thing, which is this one, plus d mu a. d mu epsilon mu. Okay, now this I rewrite by constructing a curve here. Curve of d mu d mu a minus d mu. I reconstruct this curve, epsilon mu, and then I, I add the part that I subtracted here, d mu d mu a, epsilon mu, plus I, oh, oh, uh, I have this term here, plus d mu a, d mu epsilon mu. So you see what I find? Since this is really the torsion, and the torsion in uh, our formula is, is 2 to 0. Now let's move in to the pure limit of one and two. Ra is 0. In fact, the whole thing goes through also in the supersymmetric case with sus. But let's do it uh, in, pure, in the pure gravity setting. Ra is 0, but Ra is really the covariant curve of V. And so this piece goes out, and you are left with this piece. Now, this piece looks very much like the diffeomorphism, except that here you have a Lorentz covariant derivative. You have a term that contains a um, spin connection. Now, the term that contains the spin connection, you can write it in this way. So, this is equal to d mu, d mu a, epsilon mu, plus d a mu, d mu, epsilon mu. And this is exactly how diffeomorphism looks. But then you have a term which is minus one minus omega mu a d d mu d epsilon mu. You have this term here. Right? This is an extra term that appears in uh, if you want to use this formula as an infinitesimal diffeomorphism. But is this extra term important? No, in fact, it is not important, but because you see what it is, this is a Lorentz rotation on V, right? This is a Lorentz rotation on V. You can interpret it as a Lorentz rotation on the field bind with the parameter, with a parameter, with this parameter here, this parameter here, epsilon mu V mu V. Uh, uh, epsilon mu omega mu the parameter is the following. So it's um, it's the omega mu omega mu omega mu squat. This is um sorry? So it's the direction it's um we 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 get the omega mu is um 
village. This is a new, new has to be the, the clean. So this is the new. Uh, no, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. You're totally right. Yes. 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 You're right. So in fact, that uh, means that the parameter is zero. This is the composite parameter. It is a local parameter, right? It is anti-symmetric in A and B. It is a zero fold parameter, dependent, dependent, and it is the parameter by which you are rotating the filter. Right, but this amounts to this really amounts to a Lorentz rotation, included in by symmetry. It is a Lorentz parameter on the pinion, and I know that uh, these kind of transformations leave the actual environment. And so, what I find is that this, up to a local Lorentz transformation, is really a way of writing down the diffeomorphism. That's what it is. <coughs> Exercise. This is true because you write your epsilon a as um, yes. epsilon a. Yes. Epsilon a. Because this I interpret as a flat index, right? And uh, but the diffeomorphism is naturally written into curved, the curved indices because the diffeomorphism involves coordinates, different coordinates. Yes, it is important that it is flat. So you're only choosing then the field line on the phase. I'm choosing the field line, the phases on which to express these flat coordinates. Okay, let's proceed with the group geometry. Uh, in fact, we, we finished. And uh, uh, just wanted to observe this that you see this Kata Maurer equation there. I said it is a dual formulation of the Lie algebra formulation with generator. Uh, in fact, what you see is that if you require this equation to be consistent, integrable, you take the D of this and it has to be zero. Now, if you take the D of this, the D of D will be zero, and you are left with the D that acts on this piece. The D that acts on this piece gives you one half, and then you have P, and then the C are constants, so the D doesn't see them. C is D, and then you have the P on sigma A, sigma B, and then you would have minus. Because the D is dumped on one form, so it has a minus sign in the right hand row, C and D, and you have sigma A, D sigma B. Okay, now D sigma A and D sigma B, in fact, you can flip, you can flip these here and change indices, and you see that it adds because this is anti symmetric. So what you can do is to take away this one half. Take away this, and you are left with this. Now this is equal to C, C, and D. And now instead of D sigma A, you take its expression given by D minus this P, and you put it there. Now this is then minus, and instead of sigma A, I take one half, and I have another C, here I have an A, here I have an E and an F, and I have sigma E, sigma F. This is the D sigma E. It's a factor of minus one half. And then you have the sigma D. And this, this whole thing must be zero. If this whole thing must be zero, well, this is the basis for D forms, the intrinsic basis for D forms, the field time basis for D forms. This is the basis where P, F, and D are anti symmetric So P, F, and D are anti symmetric If D 
this thing has to be zero, the coefficient, which is these with the independent elements of the basis, the coefficient has to be zero. And what you find is that this thing here, this thing here, has to be zero. And you reproduce the Jacobian entity among the structure constant. So now they are interpreted not anymore as uh, the three double commutators summing to zero, they are interpreted as the d square equals zero. The d square is the closure of the exterior d derivative. <coughs> Just to see what are what are the what are the relations between the two positions. Example. We are taking immediately the example if you wish. Well, let's jump immediately to the super point of reality. Right? An example. So now we add to the commutation relation of the point of reality the ones that involve also, also the fermionic charges. I will write them here. And indeed, here I just have charges that I will uh, call Q bar, and you will see why I'm calling that Q bar. Beta equals to minus four Q bar alpha. Gamma to D alpha beta. These are the two Spinoria indices of the matrix gamma to D. This is Spinoria index of the charge Q bar. In fact, Q bar is really the, the is really the Dirac bar doing this Q. The usual Q, the supercharge, times C. Uh, then is the other. Q A, C A B. Oh, Q A B. This is the charge conjugation matrix. I don't remember where it, yes, I put them down for the, for the usual yes. And so it is okay. This is the charge conjugation matrix that has two spinorial indices. So, so this is the Q bar that I'm interested in. <coughs> and then Q bar A, Q bar B, beta, alpha, beta. This I have to put an anti symmetry, an anti symmetry, and anti commutator, which is equal. Minus I C gamma A with indices alpha beta and T A. Uh, yes, but here I'm not consistent with the indices, right? Because I put down instead. Okay. okay. <coughs> then let's do something like this. <coughs> so these are always down. This is the yeah. Anti symmetry will is a P, and this is the algebra of the matrix. Yes, in fact, there is no metric in spinorial space, so it's not like alpha and alpha dot that you are raising and lowering with the epsilon symbol. This is, this is just a sum over the spinorial indices, and that's it. So I put everything, for example, spinorial indices down, and it will be exactly the same thing. There is a minimum matrix. This is the, the delta matrix. This is the matrix multiplication. This is 
entrepreneurial matrix in the scene or just doing matrix in the scene. In the end, the is that both the things are biased. Yes, both the things are biased. Because we are in four dimensional problems. In uh, two dimensional, then you would have two alpha and the two theta dots. But here, the, the four in four dimensions. The gamma matrices is that we did not split the thing in the bind way, so they are four by four dimensions. Okay, so this now has an immediate consequence. You can read off what are the structure functions in the super algebra, and you can plug them here. You plug them here, of course, the structure constants relative to the odd part, odd, the odd part of the super algebra will be symmetric instead of anti-symmetric in the lower indices. In the lower indices. Because, well, these things will be symmetric if they are, if they are spin or one points, then this product is symmetric and is not anymore anti-symmetric like it is in general for boson functions. And indeed, you see that these structure constants, in this case, are symmetric because we remember that C gamma A is a symmetric matrix in spin or spin. Okay, if you just take this into account, you write down the Cartan Maurer equations for this super algebra in this way. And you will have the super point array Cartan Maurer equation. Let's write them down. And what you will find is that now I will identify sigma A with dA omega A D and psi alpha psi alpha. And this will be the index A will split into A, 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 B, and alpha, because here the generator has index A, A, B, and alpha. So, I will have B, B, A, minus omega A, B, 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 compacted with the Minkowski matrix, minus psi bar, psi bar, gamma, A, B, bar. And you recognize here exactly the same structure we found when defining the torsion. But this is nothing else than the Karpa Maurer equation, the Karpa Maurer equation written for the sigma A with A equal to A, to this index here. This index here. Then I write the Karpa Maurer equation for the omega A B part of the sigma A, this one point here. With this index here, and you see, uh, you are just putting here exactly the same, the same. You see, these the structure constants, the structure constants here, you read off from the algebra and you put them here, and in fact, you find them. For example, since Q with Q gives the C gamma A T, you recognize that here you must have the C gamma A, this corresponds to Q, this corresponds to Q. Q, Q, C, gamma, A, and everything is relative to the DVA, the DVA, because here there is a DVA. So I'm just plugging in the structure constant, following the instruction of the Cartamara equation. For the omega B, the same thing, you read off the structure constant here, you see there are thetas, and then you will find omega A, B times omega B, C equals B. And this Cartamara equation. And finally, you have a third Cartamara equation for the gravitino field line. And you will find D psi minus I over 4 omega AB gamma AB psi equals D. This is it. You have these three Cartamara equations. <coughs> that are reproducing exactly the quantities that we have seen coming out of the usual treatment of the causality of dimension. But now they are coming out somehow equal to zero, right? This is what we were calling the torsion. This is what we were calling the torsion RA. This is what we are calling the Lorentz curvature, Lorentz curvature RAD. And this is what we were calling, well, the Covariant derivative 
But in this setting, if you are living on this group manifold, these quantities are zero. But it is suggested that they come out exactly in the same form as the definition of the curvature in the user formulation. So it means that we are on the correct track if we want to reinterpret everything in a group geometric way. Of course, what we have to allow to allow these one forms that are living on a group manifold, we must allow them to develop some deviation from this zero. So we will allow the manifold to deform in such a way as we will have a deformation of the group manifold, where now the field binds on this deformed group manifold do not satisfy the Cartan Marvel equation anymore, but will be allowed to satisfy. Equations that deviate from Cartan Maurer. The deviation from the Cartan Maurer equations of the rigid group manifold will be called curvatures. And this will be then the curvature of the soft group manifold. And everything will be interpreted from this soft, soft group manifold as a dynamical theory. We will be able to construct a dynamical theory for the field that has non zero curvatures. We will interpret it as. The theory on this deformed group manifold. All the symmetries of these group manifolds will be given by simply diffeomorphisms on this group manifold. You see that the group manifold is bigger than the usual Minkowski space because it has the four directions corresponding to the translation of the case. So it has these four directions here, but then it has other directions because there are more parameters in the group. Lorentz parameters, so you will have coordinates associated with the Lorentz direction, and then you will have, have coordinates associated to the supercharge direction, to the supersymmetry generated. And this is, these are the directions, the coordinates that we call theta. These will be called the uh, y and e, for example, and this is called x, x coordinates. So we will move into this big, big group manifold, deformed in such a way that I will have curvatures and I can write down the dynamical theory. Now, of course, you will say, but now I have, okay, I have interpreted everything in terms of a group, but I have a, a big space. How can I go from this big space that has many directions? It has a, Four directions for the x, six directions for the y coordinates corresponding to the six Lorentz notations, and four directions corresponding to this, 14, 14 dimensional manifold. How I reduce myself to a four dimensional field? Now, there will be a mechanism that uh, reduces it to a four dimensional field. In fact, two mechanisms, two different mechanisms. You will see what they are. They are called horizontality for Lorentz directions and uh, Reonomy for the theta directions, which is a weak form of horizontality that we will examine. Uh, I will just introduce them now in five minutes and then we will explore them more tomorrow. This I will do by writing down the general form of the diffeomorphism on a group manifold. Now, on a group manifold, diffeomorphisms, <coughs> like on any manifold, are generated by the derivative. And then I can do the same thing on the group manifold. I can consider the D derivative. The group manifold. And this I'm doing now. But I will not move anymore on the group manifold, but on the soft group manifold. So now, here, I will consider everything to be soft. So I allow, I allow this, this right-hand side to be different from zero. Actually, let me call it rho, like we called it before. And this is the curvature of the gravity manifold. I will allow this. So here, I will allow to have in general, a curvature that I will call RC. And I will define this to be the curvature. So 
that this is not the case. We are playing the game on the group menu. And these are the Captain Marvel equation that have been transformed into a curvature definition. Definition on, it's not anymore G group manifold, but it's the deformation of G, and I will call it G filter. This curvature definition reproduces exactly the quantities that I found in the supergravity field. Okay, but since we are on the soft group manifold now, the interesting thing is that I can express I can express diffeomorphisms in a suggestive way. And it is this suggestive way that will be the core of all our following considerations. And so I will derive it now in uh, two minutes here. <coughs> Just to be a little bit pedantic, since the sigma were defined to be really the field binding only the rigid group manifold that I had before with zero curvature, then it would be correct not to call them in the same way, but to call them with another letter. So I'm keeping another letter that I would call new when they have non vanishing curves. Sigma are the rigid ones that have zero curvature, the mu's are the deformed. The field bind from the deformed group Fine. Okay, now suppose you want to explore what are the diffeomorphisms, how are the diffeomorphisms of the group manifold acting on the basic fields in the new. The diffeomorphisms. You have to compute <laughs> and you compute it with the derivative, right? It will be, it will be uh, D, the stereo derivative along, and this is the infinitesimal change of the coordinates. The coordinates I'm still calling Y of the group manifold plus contraction times the stereo derivative on the new field. New field depends on Y. Let's compute it. And the output will be a master formula for the different models on a group manifold. This is the D. Then I have the dy, the dy. Uh, okay. This will be the D of the contraction over dy of D. Now the dy I can write as, as dy uh, on uh, yes, y d. It is, uh, it is a tangent vector, so I can write it uh, in general along the basis, and I write it. Down along the basis of this intrinsic tangent vector. Right? Yes, I can write it with flat indices like this. Okay, so it will be the D of D, but I acting on this, well, it will just affect the contraction of these components with these components. So I will have something like something like DYA. Right, because this is the delta AD, and so the delta AD is transformed the index into the AD. Plus, I have the rest. Dy, dua. Dua, and here I have the contraction. Okay, so this is equal to what? Now, you see, since I'm on the group manifold, deformed, I have an expression for this. Particular expression that I have only on manifolds that are originating from a group structure. And this expression is given here. You see, the D mu C is the curvature minus this. And this is what I can now 
new ingredients that are added in this variation of formula under the same object. So this is equal to this dyk minus now and I'm putting here the dv, and if you put here the dv, you have well here you would have plus dy r a minus one half d a b c d b c. So to just substitute this with this, we have this formula, and this is this gives you this is dy a minus d a b c d y b c plus the form fraction along dy the infinitesimal change of coordinates of r a but this the end line who is see this and this reconstructs just what you would call the covariant derivative of dy in this a and defining Way this is covariant derivative, but just to see it makes sense because it has a field, it has a structure function, and it acts together with the ordinary derivative. And if you sum these together, this is what we call the covariant derivative. The covariant derivative. And we have this form fraction of R. This is the suggestive way you are writing down a Victor motor. On a soft fluid member. Why it is suggested? Because you see that it incorporates two things in the formula. In fact, it unifies the concept of diffeomorphism, since it is a formula for diffeomorphism. And the concept of gauge invariance has a particular case of this when this term is not, is not present. If the second term is not present, you are left. With the covariant derivative on the parameter. And this is the general form of a gauge derivative, right? The covariant, the gauge connection varies as the covariant derivative of the parameter. So we will be able to describe with one formula, which is the formula for diffeomorphism on the soft fluid manifold, both symmetries that are interpreted as gauge variation and as true diffeomorphism. We will have true diffeomorphism when this thing, this contraction, is non zero. When this contraction is zero, then the resulting symmetry will appear as a gauge symmetry. This is the unifying picture that comes out of this formula. For example, for dy's along the Lorentz direction in our example, we will find, actually, it will be the theory that will tell us. That the curvatures which have legs into the Lorentz direction are zero. This is called horizontality of the curvatures on the Lorentz direction. If they are zero, a contraction of an object that has no legs along the Lorentz direction, a contraction along Lorentz tangent vector, will give zero because of, uh, or because of the definition of contraction. So if this gives zero, it means that Lorentz. Diffeomorphisms along Lorentz coordinates will be interpreted as gauge Lorentz transformation. They will be reinterpreted in this way. If dy will be a tangent vector along uh, translation directions, that is a true diffeomorphism, then this has better not to be zero, and it will not be zero, and indeed we will have the usual diffeomorphism rules. That I have when x coordinates are infinitesimal and so on. So, this is the scheme that we will apply tomorrow to this algebra, to these things, and what will come out is exactly the same Lagrangian that I wrote down, which you may, you may think, okay, this was expected, but this scheme, in fact, gives you a constructive algorithm. I want to convince you tomorrow. That starting from the group geometrical point of view, I have a systematic way of constructing the action. Because if you remember, if we have guessed at the action and we have guessed the transformation of the symmetry group, now we won't have to guess anymore. Everything will be will, will be an output of this of this framework. Okay.
That's it for today.